Good morning. Welcome to Phoenix. It is great to see you. My name is Richard Morales. I'm the senior minister here. And we have a fabulous Sunday uh, planned for you today. We kick off a seven-week series called Preparation for Transformation. It's a seven-week Lenten series. It'll take us all the way through, and it's going to be a process of transformation we're going to move through together. And we're also blessed to have the choir in the house. Look at them. They're so beautiful, so pretty, so abundant. Thank you guys for being here. Fabulous. So a great Sunday coming at you. Thanks so much for being here. Welcome, everyone. And my name is Jimmy Scott. I'm pastoral care minister here at the Unity of Phoenix. And my joy to be here with you this morning. However, I do have a bone to pick. <laughs> Does anyone know who the person was who perpetrated the rumor that there is no allergies in Arizona? <laughs> if that person is here this morning, <laughs> you hold are... your hand up high so yeah. I can see you and have a chat. <laughs> yeah. you know anyway, Unity <laughs> is a worldwide organization. We are in our 125th year here this year. So this is an incredible organization that teaches the principles and the ideas that were taught by Jesus Christ, and we interpret them in a modern-day manner. And what that means is that we believe in abundance and prosperity and in, in an enjoyable life for each and every person on this planet. So welcome here this morning. All right. So our church has a mission. It's a, minis- a mission of our community, and it is something that we are all called uh, to own and to give life to. And so let us speak our mission together. Unity, Unity of Phoenix, Phoenix is a loving spiritual, spiritual community that welcomes all people and honors all paths to God. We are dedicated to transforming lives by inspiring and awakening individuals to discover God's spirit within. Or let's take a deep breath. You have your cell phones with you. I want to encourage you to place those either on silence or vibrate. And for the next few moments, uh, Craig and the choir are going to lead us in our meditational song. you to take just a few moments to allow the words of that beautiful little melody to take root in your consciousness and in your heart and in your mind and in your very soul. So as we begin this process together, I invite you to take a deep breath and just relax, get comfortable. And prepare yourself for a brief inner journey. A journey from your head and your mental faculties to your heart. And as you breathe, Just allow yourself to become open and receptive to that divine presence that is always within you and around you and supporting you. And actually giving you life.
Because of the hectic pace that we live in, we frequently forget how important it is to come apart for a while. Just find a space to be quiet, and to be reflective and to be meditative. So if you have not done that this week, now is a perfect time. So one more deep breath. <sighs> Just relax. And slowly and quietly slow the mind down. The scripture says in quietness and in solitude, we find not just rest, but inspiration and guidance and direction. We find appreciation for all the gifts and joys of life. And so for that incredible reality, we give thanks in the name and through the nature of the living Christ. And so it is. And amen.
again, everyone. And a shout out to everybody who tunes in and watches us online. Thanks for joining us. So how many people here have at least one area in your life that you would like to be transformed or improved to something better? Anybody? And to me, whether it is to have increased health and physical well-being, or to heal a relationship, to have more love and harmony in it, or to increase your uh, financial abundance, or to improve your attitude and have a more positive outlook on your life, or uh, to treat yourself a little bit better, or to have a deeper connection with God. I think every one of us has an area in our lives that we would like to be transformed and improved in some way. Now, in that area that you'd like that thing transformed, how many people would like it to happen quick and easy? Quick and easy. <laughs> Fast and without effort. And I think that's how we are. We want things to change. We just don't want to have to do much work to make it happen. You know, it kind of reminds me of an absolute uh, favorite joke. You uh, will have heard it if you've taken my Unity Basics class. And it's about this Baptist guy that moves into this all Catholic neighborhood. And it's uh, the first Friday of Lent, and uh, this new guy uh, is outside grilling steaks on his grill while everybody else in the neighborhood is eating fish. And the smell, oh, that mouth-watering smell of, of steak grilling is just driving him crazy. And then so the next uh, Friday of Lent, the same thing happens, and it's driving the Catholics crazy. So all the guys decided that they got to change something. It's got to change fast. We cannot deal with this. So they all go over to the new guy's house and said, look, we, you know, we love that you're here. It's exciting, but you're in an all-Catholic neighborhood, and for you to stay here, you got to convert to Catholicism. The guy says, convert to Catholicism? So said, isn't that kind of hard? Didn't that take a long time? They said, no, it's easy. So we got the priest here, he'll do it for you. So the priest sprinkles a little water on his head, puts his hand uh, over his head, and says, born a Baptist, raised a Baptist, now a Catholic. And the guy said, that's it? He said, yeah, that's it. And so everybody's um, Lent temptation has been resolved, so everybody goes back to their home. The next Friday, when the neighborhood is all sitting down to their fish dinner, um, they, again, the intoxicating smell of a grilled steak is happening. They cannot believe. They say they can't believe their noses. They can't believe. They go over to the guy's house and say, hey, you converted to Catholicism. You're supposed to follow the rules. He said, I am following the rules. In the same way you converted me, I did a conversion experience myself. They didn't say, what are you talking about? So the guy just sprinkles a little water over the steak, puts his hand over it, and says, born a cow, raise a cow, now a fish. So, um, <laughs> so, don't you wish it could be that easy? Spring a little water, put your hand over it, and say a few words, and that situation be changed and transformed. You know, the great basketball coach, um, Bobby Knight, once said that everybody has the will to win. Everybody has a desire to succeed, to achieve, to transform, and to become something greater. Everybody has the will to win, but not everyone has the will to prepare. See, every, every one of us wants to be transformed, but everyone doesn't want to do the work that is required to transform. Everybody, I want, to, I want you to think about that thing you'd like to transform and change in your life. Think about it now, and I want you to ask yourself the question, are you really prepared for it? Have you been doing the work to prepare yourself mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually to receive that transformational change and improvement in your life? Everybody wants to be transformed and changed. Everybody wants their lives to get better, but not everyone is committed to doing the necessary work needed to prepare the way to attract and support having that very thing. Many years ago, I wanted to become a professional speaker. I was in Toastmasters, and I wanted to speak to corporations and to thousands of people, and I'd been doing small little talks with Toastmasters, you know, five to seven minutes, and I said, I was starting to say this, I want to become a professional speaker. And a friend of mine said, do you really want to become a I said, yes, I do. You really want to speak in front of thousands of people? Yes, I do. And he said, well, I, I work at this corporation. We have a conference with 2,000 people, and the uh, speaker uh, pulled out, and it's next week. You want to speak to the 2,000 people next week? I said, what, now? I said, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And so I was too scared. And, and the fact is, while I was doing the work, I hadn't fully prepared myself mentally, emotionally, spiritually to, to achieve the thing I said I wanted. And the fact is, we can have anything we want. The fact is, are you willing and are you committed to doing the necessary and especially internal work needed to create, to attract, and support yourself having, attracting, and experiencing that great thing? 
And we just had the Super Bowl. And the one thing about Bill Belichick, been to six Super Bowls, won four of them. And they say the reason he's a great coach is he is a master of preparation. He prepares better than anyone, gets his team Betty, uh, better prepared than anyone. I had a guy painting my house. His name was Alvin. I said, Alvin, what makes you such a good painter? I said, what? He said, it's not really the painting that's the big thing. It's preparing to paint. Blocking everything off, setting everything. He said, preparation is the key to success. And the truth is, if you want to transform your life, you need to prepare yourself and to do the necessary work that will naturally facilitate and bring it forward. You know, when you look at Jesus, he's, he taught in such great ways by his words, but he also taught by his example. And if you look at his example, he always prepared himself for everything. He prepared himself every single morning to go out and do his day. He prepared for his preaching. He prepared for the miracles. He prepared for the challenges. And the greatest thing he prepared for and took the time to prepare for was to begin his ministry by withdrawing into the wilderness for 40 days a time of praying and fasting and getting himself mentally, emotionally, and spiritually prepared for all of the work he was supposed to do that culminated in the miraculous resurrection on Easter. To me, Lent is the observation of 40 days of Jesus' spiritual preparation, and it invites us to do our spiritual preparation for something miraculous um, to, to rise from each and every one of us. It's interesting, it was 40 days. You know, so many things, you know, the number 40 is mentioned in the Bible 146 times. So many things happen. You know, Moses spent 40 days up in the mountain. He came down uh, with the Ten Commandments. The spies uh, were out for 40 days in the land, uh, spying out the promised land. Uh, Elijah traveled for 40 days to the cave where he received his vision. Um, Nineveh was given 40 days uh, to repent and change. There were all kinds of 40s, including Jesus' preparation. You know what 40 actually represents? It represents a period, not necessarily four days, but a period of discipline, devotion, and preparation for something greater to come forth. Here's what Ralph Marston, one of my favorite spiritual writers, said. He said, great opportunities are everywhere, and the people who benefit most from them are those who are best prepared. Preparation can be tedious, and it's usually not very exciting, yet the result it brings can be tremendously exciting. Being sufficiently prepared will open doors that you otherwise would never see. The time and effort you spend in practicing, in learning, in developing skills, and laying the groundwork for achievement may not pay off immediately. Yet those efforts spent in preparation will indeed pay off, and when they do, uh, they will pay off big for you. You know, most of us rather skip the preparation, but the truth is the preparation is what creates a transformation. And I think there's something magical and powerful in dedicating and committing ourselves to the inner work necessary to bring forth something more amazing. So everyone, I want you to hold something in your head. What would you like to be transformed in? What area would you like to hold? And we're going to work on this for the next seven weeks, so hold it in your head. But here's the bigger question. For that thing that you want, are you really committed to doing the preparation and the inner work to make it happen? So the first thing we're going to do on our first journey it's going to sound ridiculously simple. First step in preparation is to breathe. So everyone, take a deep breath. Let it out. Take another deep breath. And let it out. Breathing sounds like a silly way to start, but it's profound. You know, breathing is natural. Breathing is the most, na most vital nutrient to life. The most vital. You can go three weeks without food, and the body can live. You can go three to five days without water, but you can only go very few minutes without air, without oxygen. Air and breathing is the life force. It is the life energy. And the thing is, we do it naturally. We do it automatically. When you're not thinking, you're breathing. You're always breathing, breathing, breathing. It's easy to breathe. And the thing is, we take breathing for granted. And we know we, we, we need it to live, but there are other areas that it impacts our lives that we don't even realize. Do you know that there's an intimate relationship between how we breathe and the quality of our mental, emotional, and spiritual states? That our breathing impacts how we feel, and our feeling impacts how we breathe. And as natural as breathing is, you know what? Many of us develop some unhealthy breathing patterns with bad posture and hunching and slouching. It actually restricts the amount of oxygen that we get, which lowers our energy and our vitality, makes us mentally sluggish. And when we get uh, down and, 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 and in depressed and despair, it makes our breathing shallow. 
So in many ways, we pick up shallow breathing habits. You know, we limit the restriction of flow in our bodies, and it affects our moods. It affects our attitudes. It affects our energy. And in some place, reduced levels of oxygen actually put us at a higher risk for um, d- uh, disease, heart attack, stroke, everything. So, so, so the flow of oxygen in us is vitally important. I think many of us don't realize the control that we have over, uh, or the lack of control sometimes we have over our own breathing. You know, I heard somebody say, if, if you sit up straight and you breathe deeply and you smile, you can't be depressed. So let's sit up, sit up straight, <laughs> smile, take a deep breath, let it out. Another deep breath, smile. See, are you feeling depressed? I'm feeling pretty good. We all look ridiculous, but we're not depressed. Here's another one. Okay, so I want you to breathe and have a posture of someone that is powerful, energetic, and excited. Go ahead and do that. Just breathe. Feel powerful, energetic, and excited. And my question, how many people feel powerful, energetic, and excited? And silly too, but that's okay. Okay. And here's my point to you. In the course of our lives, we don't always consciously use this gift of breath. In many ways, we use it in shallow, unconscious ways rather than deep and conscious ways that can bring about and raise our level of mood, raise our level of awareness, raise our our, our level of efficiency and productivity. And it might seem silly, but breath and how you use it is the beginning of changing and transforming, not just your mood, but your life. How many people in here know you could do a better job in consciously and positively and intentionally using how you breathe and the power of your breath? How many people know that? We all do. So let's start. What's the first thing we could do to improve our breath? And that is that it helps us get calm and relax. You know, every one of us tends to be pretty tense in our lives. We get very, very tense. You know when you focus on doing something, they say all the muscles kind of constrict, and when you get so focused on something, your breathing gets more shallow. Anybody ever like working out? Like when I work out, I do this. (laughs) And then I go. (sighs) Anybody ever do that? You know, it's so funny that sometimes we get into a pattern of actually holding our breath, and it creates more tension in us. Everyone take a deep breath. Notice your neck and shoulders. Take another deep breath. Relax your neck and shoulders. How many people found there's a little bit of tension in your neck and shoulders? And here's my question. Why? You're in church. (laughs) You're safe. What would you be tense about? But the point is, we habitually get tense. And one of the things that's important, and we've all, pr- all probably done breathing exercises, is that it helps relax us. And you know why? Because breathing is automatic, and it's usually controlled in the brainstem, in the med- med- medulla oblongata, and that's where it tends to, And that means that in the cerebral cor- cortex, there are lots of thoughts and emotions and feelings. But when you breathe consciously, you move the control from the medulla to the cerebral cortex. And when you breathe consciously, guess what? The thoughts and the emotions are distracted because you're focusing on your breath. And when you focus on your breath and let go of the thoughts, guess what? Your body relaxes. Isn't that interesting? As we focus on our breath, the body begins to relax. And you know what? When you're relaxed, guess what? You're more peaceful, you're more aware, you're more prepared, and you're more positive to handle whatever is before you. So everyone, let's focus on our breath for a moment. I invite you, eyes open or closed, take a deep breath. And at the inhale part, count one. Now exhale, two. Feel the air as it comes in, three. Feel the air as it leaves, four. Inhale, feel your chest and belly expand, five. Exhale, feel it contract, six. Deep breath, seven. Exhale, relax, eight. One last one, deep breath in. Nine, and exhale, 10. And now just open your eyes. How many people feel a little more relaxed? Okay, don't get too relaxed because I have 15 more minutes of talking to do, but. (laughs) So the interesting thing is there's a habitual level of tightness and what we can do is to catch ourselves in moments and I will tell you, if you just pause in your day two or three times, even for 30 seconds and just Breathe in. You will begin to begin to relax. And you will begin to recenter. You will begin to be more calm and more present to handle what is before you. You know, the, the human reaction when we get bad news is this. 
Don't we do that? We get scared and we stop breathing. We stop breathing. You know, and you know, in those tough times, we actually need to breathe through those difficult moments. Perfect example is Jesus with the loaves and fishes. Everybody knows that story, and all they think about is there wasn't enough. There were 4,000 people or 5,000, not enough loaves. Jesus took the bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He shared it, and there was enough. That's what everybody always thinks. That is a transformation story, wasn't it, of lack, and then he did his thing, and then there was an abundance. It's a transformation story, but people don't really always remember the first thing he did. What was the first thing he did? Okay, let me tell you. The first thing he did was he had the people sit down on the grass. And to me, the first thing when things don't go well, to me, is to take a deep breath and relax. See, it's easy when things don't go well to go to fear, to go to lack, you know, to go to worry and anxiety. What Jesus is saying here by his example is when things don't go well in your life, guess what? Go to your breath and just take a deep breath. That it will keep you calm and centered. You know, I've lost my job and I don't know how I'm gonna pay my bills. Breathe. I have to have a serious talk with uh, my spouse, and I'm not sure how they're going to take it. Breathe. You know, my family is in conflict and turmoil, and I don't know what to do. Breathe. You know, my mom's got cancer, and I'm just devastated. I don't know how to help her. Breathe. You know, I've been to the masseuses, and when they massage in you, there's a tight area. They'll keep on it, but they'll just tell you, breathe through it. You get a needle, they tell you, breathe through it. To me, Jesus is giving us a great example of not just for the tension to kick, connect yourself and breathe to calm you, but in the times of trouble and challenge, take a deep breath and let it center you because it will go from fear, uh, fearful to peaceful you know, and, and from feeling weak to feeling more powerful when you connect with your breath. This week, I invite you to pause just for 10, 15 seconds, center with your breath, and particularly in the tough times, just breathe. And I guarantee you'll be more aware and you will be more centered and more powerful. Second important thing about breath and what it does, it connects us, uh, it connects us to God. You know the word uh, breath, it actually means spirit. The word breath means spirit. So when you're breathing in, you're not just breathing in oxygen and air. You are breathing in the very source that makes life possible, that you are breathing in the Spirit of God. In Sanskrit, that word breath means prana, which means life force. That every breath you take, you are breathing in the life force and the creative energy that makes everything possible. The life force that not only beats your heart, but created you in its own image and likeness. So often when we're shallow breath, we feel weak and powerless and disconnected. When you take a deep breath, it grounds you and can remind you of the Spirit of God that is in you. The Spirit of God that has made you and the Spirit of God through which all things are made possible. One of the things about breathing, it not only connects us with God, but it connects us and reminds us of the truth of who we are. Because sometimes we think we're weak and helpless and hopeless, and that's not the truth. It says that you have been created in the image and likeness of God that you are the temple of the living God. And I love what it says in 2 Timothy. It says, God has not given you a spirit of fear and timidity, but a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. That's the truth of who you are. I am created in the image and likeness of God. Together, I am created in the image and likeness of God. Take a deep breath. The Spirit of God lives in me. Together. The Spirit of God lives in me. Deep breath. Feel a connection to that truth. God has given me a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Together. God has given me a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Deep breath. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Together. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Deep breath. I love what it says in the Songs of Solomon. It says, breath restores me to my exact self. And I love that. Breath restores me to an awareness that God's Spirit is in me and that I have a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. You know, sometimes we can be like the prodigal son. You remember the prodigal son left his uh, family home, left his father and was squandering, and he was, 
lost everything, and he was just down and out, eating with the pigs. And my favorite line that really changed his life is it said, and then he came to himself. And then he came to himself. He, I see him just taking a breath of frustration, but a breath of realizing, hey, I'm greater than this. And maybe we have an area in our lives that we're living at a lower level, that we're settling for certain things. We aren't living up to our goals, our dreams, our greatness, where we're letting things overcome us and overwhelm us. And the fact is, I love that. Breath restores me to myself. And, and we can use our breath to bring us back to ourselves so we can unify with the Father and the truth of who we are to live the authentic life, and to be who we came here to be. Your breath can help anchor you and center you back to the truth of God's presence in you and the truth of who you are. One of the interesting things I find about yoga, how many people take yoga here? Yoga. I love how they make you focus on your breath while you're contorting into some goofy, difficult uh, um, movements and positions. But the cool thing I find is they make you focus on your breath while you're in these movements. But interestingly, when you focus on your breath while you're in these movements, these movements become easier. They become more well-coordinated. They become more in sync when you're aware of your breath while you're actually doing the thing. Isn't that amazing? At first, it's awkward to sync your breath and your actions together. But when you start doing it, you actually feel totally aligned and in the flow because the essence of who you are and through your breath actually begins to come through the very thing that you're doing, even when it's difficult. So could you imagine aligning yourself with your breath and connecting and knowing your presence of God even while you're working? Could you imagine how different that would be? Could you imagine how different it would be to connect and align yourself with your breath and who you are even while you're eating or working out? or in a relationship, or spending time with your family, that connecting ourselves through our breath and it bringing it forth into our work, just like with yoga, the harmonizing of it can produce amazing results. Our breath can calm us in the tightened areas and calm us and relax us through the troubled times. It can connect us to God and connect us to the truth of who we are and get ourselves aligned. And the third thing I love about um, our breath is that it can open us and particularly open our heart. Have you ever had someone do something not nice or unkind or ignore you or not say something that you want them to say and you close your heart off to them? Anybody ever close your heart off to somebody? Or, okay, three of us, but that's okay. <laughs> and sometimes we shut down. And I'll tell you, one of the most powerful things is to everyone take a deep breath and just open your heart. Sometimes we close our heart thinking it's going to protect us keep us safe, but the truth is when you close your heart, you actually create more pain. You create more isolation. You put up more walls and, 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 and create um, you know, less joy in your own life. And even if we're going through difficulty, we need to actually take a deep breath and begin to consciously open our hearts. This week or even in this moment, if you have conflict with someone, if you have a disagreement, if you're leaving someone out of your heart because you don't like something they did or they said, I invite you to use your breath. Again, take a deep breath. And just open your heart. Open your heart to this person. Just open your heart to God. Open your heart to more love and more fulfillment in your life. And I guarantee you, you thinking about that person from a more open-hearted place will give you the guidance you need as to what to say or not say, whether to stay away or to connect or call or whatever you need to do. Because when a heart is open, love can flow. When heart is open, the wisdom and the joy and the goodness we can feel can actually come through. To open your heart is to open yourself to hope and to new possibilities and to change and whatever direction, new direction you might need to move in. You know, one of the interesting things uh, I think about our breath, and, 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 and here's the reason why I say breathe. Here's the reason why. Because breathing's not just fundamental, but it's amazing how we develop such shallow breathing patterns. And you know why that amazes me? Like we breathe such a small amount is Look how much air is around. Have you noticed? And yet we breathe shallow. Isn't there a message there? There's so much more air that's available to us, and yet we choose to restrict and limit the amount of air that we take into our bodies. There is a spiritual message there. There is so much love and life, and we're not allowing ourselves to take it in. The reason I say take a deep breath and take a deep breath now, take a deep breath, it's not like you don't know how to breathe. It's to remind you there's more breath in you than you're taking in. There's more love, more life, more hope, more joy, more spirit, more good, more gratitude than you're allowing into your life. There's a great line in, in the story, uh, play, Man of La Mancha, and it says, take a deep breath of life 
and decide how it should be lived. And so my question for you is, are you breathing deeply in life? Are you taking in all the love and the joy and the goodness and raising the standard and the quality of how much you take in and how much good that you share? I love what Elizabeth Barrett Browning said. She said, who, who, he, whoever breathes the most air lives the better life. And why? Think about that. Because those who breathe the most air tend to be more calm and relaxed and aware. Those who breathe more air tend to be more connected with God connected with the truth of who they are and are more in line with living their true life, authentic life. And those who breathe more air tend to op be more open-hearted, to be more accepting, more appreciative, and tend to enjoy their lives the most. Every one of us can transform our lives. And this week I invite you to use the gift and the tool that God has given you, the gift of breathing, and use your breath to open you and to connect you, to calm you, and to allow you to be transformed in an amazing and powerful way. God bless you all. And now the kids will help lead us in our prayer of protection. Anybody want to join in first? Okay, here we go together. Parker, you want to help out? Okay, here we go. The light. Great job, Parker. Thank you guys so much. Great job, kiddos. All right, everybody, let's all rise now as we sing our song of peace. Have a great day and a wonderful week.